Welcome, everyone. I am David Weinstein, director of the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, also known as CJEB, at Columbia Business School. On behalf of the center, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our webinar, The Father of Japan's Modern Economy and Capitalism, Eiichi Shibusawa, His Timeless Vision, Philosophy, and Legacy. As you know, uh, Shibusawa was a leader in, in Japan whose life spanned uh, the very beginning of the Meiji Restoration or the end of the Tokugawa period all the way up until the early 1930s. While I understand that many of you know about CJEB already, before we get started with today's event, I will just give a brief introduction of the center. CJEB was established in 1986 by Professor Hugh Patrick, and in July 2019, I became the new director with Hugh staying on as chairman. Our mission at CJEB is to promote knowledge and understanding of Japan's economy and its business systems in an international context. We continue to pursue our mission in the world's new normal through webinars like our talk today. I'm honored to introduce our speaker today, Ken Shibusawa, Chief Executive Officer of Shibusawa and Company Incorporated and founder and chairman of Commons Asset Management. Mr. Shibusawa founded Shibusawa and Company, a strategic advisory firm for alternative investments, ESG, SDGs alignment, and human resource development in 2001. He also founded Commons Asset Management, a mutual fund dedicated to delivering long-term investment opportunities to the Japanese household in 2008. He has extensive market experience at JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, as well as More Capital, a global macro hedge fund, where he was the representative managing director of the Tokyo office. He is also director of Keizai Doyukai, uh, which is translated as Japan Association of Corporate Executives and a steering committee member of the UNDP SDG Impact. Mr. Shibusawa has also worked extensively to preserve the legacy of his great, great grandfather, Mr. Eiichi Shibusawa. Uh, Mr. Shibusawa was a leading figure in the development of Japan's modern society, who's also involved in the founding of some 500 enterprises and economic organizations, as well as 600 organizations for social welfare, education, and international exchange. Determined to promote individual and private initiatives, he was a champion of civil society from the late 19th through the early decades of the 20th century. And as some of you may know, Japanese banknotes will be redesigned for the first time in two decades in 2024. And Mr. Eiichi Shibusawa will be the face of the 10,000 yen bill. I also understand that Mr. Shibusawa's life is featured in NHK's Saturday Night Historical Drama Series this year, which I'm sure makes Mr. Ken Shibusawa very busy. I'm looking forward to learning not only about Mr. Shibusawa's life and work, especially in light of the recent increase in attention to corporate and social obligations in Japan, but also about the work Mr. Ken Shibusawa has done to carry on his great great grandfather's legacy. Before I turn it over to Mr. Shibusawa, I want to take a moment to thank our corporate and individual sponsors for the generous donations, which allow us to continue to develop and deliver exceptional webinars like this one. Mr. Shibusawa, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction, David. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Ken Shibusawa. Uh, good morning for you, for those of you joining us from Japan, and good evening um, for you in the United States, uh, but understand from all over the world. So thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this, uh, th for this event. Um, my name is Ken Shibusawa, um, and I'll be speaking for the next 30 minutes regarding my great-great-grandfather, um, but um, the, the gist of the talk is not to reflect <clears throat> the past, but to rather for, for, to look, think about our future. Um, just as a brief background of myself, I was um, made in Japan, 
um, but I'm the product of the American uh, public education system from second grade in elementary school all the way through uh, college. Um, after I graduated from the university in the mid 80s, I came back to Japan for a couple of years, worked at a uh, uh, NGO, Japanese NGO in, uh, in areas of uh, foreign affairs. Um, and then I uh, went back to business school. <clears throat> and then this was in the getting to be the late you know, 80s when Japan was booming. So through business school, I went from the nonprofit sector to the extreme profit sector, um, and where I, I, you know, spent my career in my late 20s and 30s at places like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and, and more capital. So as you can see, um, my uh, background, <clears throat> um, even though I knew about my great grand grandfather, um, I was not really in his sort of sphere of thinking <laughs> in those days. But um, as I was reaching my 40s, I started my own company in 2001. Um, and up until then, I thought that my great great grandfather uh, didn't have any interest in um, leaving any um, assets for his ancestors or for his descendants, you know, so because there's, there's not a single stock in, in, in my name, even though he's known to have started about 500 companies. Um, but I discovered that actually he did leave a very, very valuable asset. And this asset, um, there's no inheritance tax, <clears throat> um, so it doesn't decrease, but depending how you utilize it, it actually increases. And, and this valuable assets is actually his words. Um, he left a bunch of bunch of words um, for, not just for, you know, for, for me, but, but for, for, for the uh, generations that came after him. Um, um, but you have to realize my highest level of education in Japan was uh, second grade in elementary school. So I had a very, very difficult time um, reading what uh, his uh, words were back then. Um, uh, but I, I got I had a little bit of help from my father. He translated old Japanese into present day Japanese. And, and that, that's how I really got started. Um, that his words actually, because it was said in the era about 100, 150 years ago, um, but there was a sense of uh, in Japanese mirai shiko, so it's like looking at always towards the future. And so I've, you know, what I discovered was that if you translate that into present day language, it, it's, re it's really applicable to present day Japan, probably because the era of Japan, I think, I believe is, is shifting in the era of the global economy is shifting in a sense. And so in a sense, that's, I think, calling back uh, Shibusawa Eichi from his place 100 and 150 years ago. Um, about a year and a half ago, <clears throat> um, this headline kind of caught my eye. Um, this was uh, uh, Jamie Dimon, which was uh, the CEO of J.P. Morgan and also the uh, chairman of the Business Roundtable, uh, basically said that, you know, we as corporate managers have been looking after shareholder value for all these years. But now going forward, uh, we need to be taking after looking after the interest of, of the employees, of the customers, uh, of, of our business partners and, and the society. <clears throat> so basically he was saying, um, not only shareholder capitalism, but what's important is stakeholder capitalism. And about a year ago, <clears throat> this, this article also caught my eyes that stakeholder capitalism arrives at Davos, the World Economic Forum, um, you know, which, which is a, a forum where, where they, uh, the, the winners of the capitalist society actually <laughs> get gather, right? Um, and of course, uh, people at Davos saying, oh no, no, we've been saying this for the last 50 years. <clears throat> but in any case, Stakeholder capitalism is, is a kind of a new wave <clears throat> currently in the way of thinking of capitalism. And of course, almost every day uh, we hear or see this word ESG, environment, S, social, G, governance. So this, this, is, this is the time. And, and you think about it, <clears throat> you know, ESG around 2005, 2006, back then, it was, a, it was an area for specialists. And it wasn't sort of the focus for corporate management or, or the capital markets, you know, 15 years ago. But especially here in Japan, the last five years, <clears throat> this ESG has, you know, has really come to the main focus uh, of corporate management and also the capital markets. So th this is the kind of time <clears throat> that we're, we're living in currently. So in, in this context, so he arrives. Uh, Eiji Shibusawa. He's known as the father of Japanese capitalism, but he never used the word capitalism, shihon shugi. Um, he, he used the word capitalist, shihon ka, but not capitalism. Um, he used this word called gappon shugi. 
the characters meaning merge, awaseru, <coughs> and moto. Uh, for those st studying uh, Japanese, moto looks like a book, but basically it, it, it's, a, it's like a source. So basically what this Gapon is saying is you're merging resources together uh, to create value. Um, in 1873, uh, which is the sixth year of the Meiji Restoration, um, Shibasawa Eichi starts a uh, startup a startup that nobody have seen before here in Japan up until that date. And that startup is called a bank in, in Japanese, ginko. Um, the word ginko didn't exist, so they had to invent the new word. Um, so because it was a new startup, um, he had to figure out a way to <clears throat> um, show to the pub public what, what this new startup was all about. Um, he basically said a bank is like a mighty river, uh, a money that doesn't gather at a bank is like a dewdrop. <clears throat> Um, but if it gathers at a bank, then um, you know it has power. As a dewdrop, it doesn't have much power. But if it gathers at a bank, starts to flow, um, there, there's power behind it, uh, power to enrich the society and the economy. Um, currently, um, it seems like to me capitalism is becoming a, a, a dirty word <clears throat> for many people. Um, it, it creates uh, what we call here in Japan black corporations. <clears throat> um, it creates uh, um, what do you call it in English? Kaksa. So it's di um, divergency of the have and the have nots. Um, and, and also it destroys the environment. And so, you know, capitalism should be put to an end. Um, some people are saying that. Um, but as we can see, uh, capitalism here in Japan wasn't all about um, bring to riches for, for the elite <clears throat> or for, uh, for one individual, um, but it was to bring the resources together, form a mighty river, um, and then have a, a prosperous uh, economy and, and society for, for all. Um, that, that was the root of Japanese capitalism. Now, this word, gappon shugi, is not used today. <clears throat> so there's no English translation, obviously, for gappon shugi. Um, but if I had to translate it into English, gappon shugi, what, what would it be? I think it would be stakeholder capitalism. What, what is a stakeholder? Stakeholder are resources, <clears throat> uh, resources that play different parts, but they merging together, uh, putting their resources together. Um, that's how you're creating corporate value. So in a sense, um, what stakeholder capitalism, which is kind of a new thing in the world of cap capitalism these couple of years, actually the same kind of thinking existed here in Japan, you know, 150 years ago. So, um, Anybody know what this is? This is this is this is the uh, longo, which is the analects of Confucius, uh, which represents virtue. Um, and on the other hand, what is this? This is the abacus soroban, which is the well, the original handheld calculator, basically. Um, and my and this is represents business in that, in that sense. And so my great great grandfather H. Shibusa basically said <coughs> longo and soroban together. So. What is longo and soroban? <clears throat> um, it, 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 basically, people translate it into like ethical capitalism, um, and that's that's basically what it is. Um, that you should you should practice ethics uh, in terms of in running your business. Um, but if you just leave it at ethical capitalism, <clears throat> it doesn't really. It only I think rings a bell for for a few, and it it doesn't 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 spread, you know, and, and, but I think that if you translate longo and soroban into present day language in a different context, but keeping the essence of what Shibusai wanted to say, um, I, th I think there's lots of uh, uh, people that would, could um, grasp on to what, what he was trying to say about 100 and 150 years ago. Um, longo and soroban is, is a book that was published back in 1916, I believe, 1916, uh, which is the fifth year of the Taisho period. Um, and it's a book not written by Shibusaichi, but it, it's a collection of his uh, public speakings. <clears throat> and so, but, but it is, it is his, his words about, you know, 100 and 120 year, years ago. And in that, he says something like this. Um, even though the corporate executive become wealthy, uh, if the society is left in poverty, then his own happiness will not last. 
um, maybe we could use the word well-being, which is kind of a new, new word these days that we use. Um, so basically saying if the 1% becomes wealthy, but the 90-90% is left behind, then his own well-being will not endure the test of time. Um, says something like this as well. If wealth is not achieved through integrity, then it will not endure the test of time. That is why it is important for us today to make efforts to integrate Longo and Soroban, which appears to be so far apart. So um, from this two um, teachings that he left, thoughts that he left, um, I thought, well, what H was trying to say about 100, 150 years ago, um, that uh, the, the well-being will not endure, that wealth will not endure. Um, basically, I think what he was saying, Longo and Soroban, 100, 150 years ago, uh, is this notion of sustainability. Um, if you don't know how to use the Soroban, um, there, there's no sustainability. Um, but if that's all you're looking at, <clears throat> maybe that's not so sustainable either. You might trip over. Um, if you're leaving, just reading the Longo <clears throat> uh, teachings of um, Confucius, that's fine. But when the world is changing, if the only thing you're doing is reading the Longo, um, that, that's not so sustainable either. Um, I think um, H. Sibusa basically said you had to merge the two together. It's kind of like a, just like this uh, a car moving forward with two wheels. If the one wheel is very large and the one wheel is very small, you can't go straight and you end up going turning around in circles. And so me, to me, Longo and Soroban in present day language is this notion of sustainability, um, which leads to another important keyword called inclusion. Basically, it's not just for the 1%, um, but the 99% should be included. Um, so I believe this Longo and Soroban is basically in our present day language is sending a message of sustainability uh, and inclusion. And in, in that respect, <clears throat> The most important, I think, aspect of Longo and Soroban is actually this word, and. Uh, it's, not, it's not or. Um, or is exclu exclusive. It's zero, one, black or white, and it, and it, it increases uh, efficiency. Um, so it's, it's very, very important in running an organization, obviously. And if you're trying to analyze something, or is diff it's very, very important. If you're going shopping, it's important. During COVID, obviously, or is, you know, if you're, if you're contagion, if we're not, they're very important. But with the power of or, um, you're basically comparing something that already exists <clears throat> and, and you're not creating any, anything new from it. Um, but the power of and <clears throat> is basically you're trying to put together two, two aspects, two sources together, which may not fit apparently <clears throat> at, at, the, at the first stake. But the thing, I think the trick here is, is, is to, to to, to have a trial and error uh, um, and, and not give up. Um, and, and if you try to put something together and if, if the, uh, the environment <clears throat> is set up in a, in a, a proper way, um, maybe there's a new chemical reaction and you get new creation. Um, so it's basically, and, and the power of and for me is you might not have the answer right in front of you, but, but trying to merge these two aspects together Basically, you're trying to create um, something new from it. And if you think about it, um, the current SDGs, this is the power of and, right? It's, it's, it's about inclusion. And it's also about um, what we call moonshot, something that's not really, you know, you can't, it's not achievable presently. <clears throat> but if you moonshot and from that ideal, and if you're able to merge that future ideal with the present, that's, that's also, I think, the power of and. Um, so I think basically what SDGs are saying is saying is we're trying to create something that's sustainable um, from parts that maybe doesn't seem like it's going to fit immediately, but but very, very important to try to um, try to keep on uh, achieving towards that goal. So um, this is basically, I think, my, my feeling uh, or my sort of quick, <clears throat> really quick and dirty uh, version of, of what Longo and, and Soroban is, is all about. Um, but why is it important for us to think about Longo and Soroban in, in present day Japan? Um, because I think, uh, because it's for our future. Um, but when we think about the future, we all, usually think about it in a straight line, the extra, extrapolation of a straight line. And so back in the 1980s, 80s, we thought the, what we see the present day, you know, right, right, what's, what's what happening in front of you, uh, straight line to the future. <clears throat> and obviously that didn't happen. Um, and, and currently, 
um, the way we look at the future is Japan's an aging population and we'll just keep on fading away <clears throat> in a straight line. Um, but I think the future never arrives in a straight line. Um, and that hint, I think, comes from here. It says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Um, this is a very, very you know, uh, famous quote from Mark Twain, basically saying that history doesn't repeat itself all the time, but there's a rhyme, which I interpret it as, as, a, as a rhythm. <clears throat> there's a rhythm. So, so if you look into the past, there's a rhythm, or I guess you could call cycles. <clears throat> Maybe that rhythm is still going on in, into the future. Um, so looking back in, into Japan, what, what kind of rhythm what was in the modern day Japan? Uh, 1990, this, this was the uh, peak of the bubble years. Um, and that was more in 1961. So for the 30 years <clears throat> since I was born, Japan was said, you know, Japan is number one. This was the 30 years of prosperity for Japan, basically. So what was the 30 years prior? Um, this is the, the war years. And what's a war? Um, a lot of destruction, <clears throat> it's the era er of destruction. But basically through the destruction, we had a great reset. And so from the old norm went to the new norm. And th maybe that's perhaps why the next 30 years uh, was able to prosper. Um, let's go back another 30 years. In 1904, 1905, there was the Russo-Japanese War. And that was a significant event, basically saying that an emerging state <clears throat> in the Far East caught up with the modern economies uh, you know, of the West <clears throat> in, in, a, in a very quick time. And so basically, and this was the era when I think, if you look at uh, if the history of Japan <clears throat> in this era, probably up until that point was probably an era when, when the ordinary citizens probably lived the most you know, uh, a well, well-being life <clears throat> that they ever had uh, up until that point. Um, then, um, looking back another 30 years, and th this is the Meiji Restoration, which is a very famous um, uh, new start, right? Re reset for Japan. There was a, almost a 270 years of the old norm, um, which was basically destructed, um, and in a new merging state started the Meiji Restoration. So it's a very, very, um, a very simplistic. <coughs> uh, recap of the past. But if you kind of look at it, you kind of see this rhythm. There was this 30 years of destruction, 30 years of prosperity, 30s of destruction, 30s of prosperity. And in 1999, um, we we're basically told that um, beyond that uh, Japan lost a decade. And they were like, we lost two decades, uh, we lost three decades. But perhaps, perhaps if this rhythm is still going on, it's not, it wasn't a lost decades. Um, but maybe it was 30 years of destruction. And if this, this, if this rhythm is correct, well, guess what? <clears throat> We're supposed to be in the new uh, era of prosperity now. Now, um, I've been using this slide for the last 10 years <laughs> for, for, for all, all kinds of public uh, uh, speaking engagements. Um, and at the end of 2019, I thought, ah, may, maybe this slide, I can't use it anymore. Um, you know, then because I felt like per currently there's lots of uh, old norms being changed into no new norms, but there wasn't this pinpoint destruction <clears throat> that I could point to. Um, then 2020 opened up and, and we had COVID. And if you think about it, it's not like a destruction, like a war, but even when there was a world war, I don't think the world stopped <clears throat> at one time. Um, but we, that happened this time. So, as, so I think we have, I finally <laughs> found this sort of um, significant event here um, that really is changing the mark for, for, for a new era for the world, but especially I think in, my, my, in the context of my uh, looking uh, for Japan. Um, of course, 10 years ago, I didn't think that, you know, we're gonna have COVID in 2020. There's no way I could have foreseen that. But um, the reason why I started thinking about this rhythm <clears throat> was the fact that I thought 2020 was gonna be a very, very important time for Japan. Um, I felt that um, 2020 leading up to the 10, 20, 30 years up to 2020, um, and then beyond 2020 from 10, 20 years, it would be a totally different world, different society. <clears throat> um, the reason why I thought that was I was looking at uh, Japan's uh, demographics. This is Japan in 1930. Um, my father turned 91 last year, um, but you know he was one years old and Japan was this beautiful, beautiful pyramid shaped uh, um, demo demographic society. Um, then the war ends in 1950, 
um, then we get a lot of uh, children. This is called the Dankai Sedai. So it's the baby boomers for here in Japan. 1960s, um, th this is the era I was born. Um, the, so the baby boomers kind of came back down a little bit, but still we had this pyramid. And this is the, this is the time in 1961 here in Japan, we got a national health care system and we had a national pension system uh, back in 1961 basically looking at this population pyramid, demographics, lots of young <clears throat> people working, supporting the elder. Um, that, that this was the, the, uh, the, the, the period. In the 1970s and 80s, if you think about it, the, the, the uh, baby boomers are becoming, uh, coming to the workforce and they're having families. Um, so in 1980s, um, we were, th were told that we were, joined, uh, we were in the bubble years but if you think about it, there was a real demand of the household with, with lots of people working with children, which meant they probably moved, which probably meant, meant well, you need to buy new household appliances, you need to buy a new car, and all that kind of stuff. So there's actually real, real demand um, supporting the, the, the growth for the Japan in the 1980s. Uh, then if you come into 1990, um, we leave the Showa period, <clears throat> and we're in the Heisei period. And when, when we look at the Heisei period, the Japanese demographic chart like this, we can't use the word pyramid anymore. It's like this sort of, I don't know how you pronounce it in English, but it's the Hyotangata, <clears throat> so there's this two, two bulges. And basically this two bulges um, for the last um, several years go up like this, right? Um, this, is, this was, I can't really see the top end of my chart here, but anyway, so um, this is probably, I can't. <laughs> This Zoom thing is difficult because I can't see the top end. What, what year is this? <laughs> 2010. 2010. Yes. To 2015, 2020, right? <clears throat> this is 2020. So, so if you look at it <clears throat> from for the last 30 years, basically we've seen this, this two bulges just sliding upwards like this. <clears throat> then from 2020, what happens? Check it out. We have this massive, massive change of the pyramid into this reverse pyramid. So what's happening um, is, I hope this is 2050, around 2050 or 2045. Yes, it is 2050. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so basically, um, we're, you know, we're into this period. What you know, what everybody uh, has been pointing out, this really aging society. Um, but what what that's telling us is basically that we're having this big, major demographic shift. <clears throat> so we talk about DX a lot these days, digital transformation. Um, the important, um, it's important to have DX here in Japan, but. Um, we're having this huge DX already. It's, it's the demographic transformation fr from the old. So people that were, were was able to uh, to form the, the um, to support the, the success model of the past, basically is passing the baton to the next generation. So um, if you look at this, <clears throat> you go like, well, there's no way, no way, no way that Japan can prosper. Looking at this, but but I think in a sense you're extrapolating the past success model into the future. And if you do that, um, you know th th there obviously is no success there. Um, so, but this is actually a future that's going to be realized. So I, I see this as mieru mirai, which means the uh, future that you can actually see. But if you think about it, in hopefully this is 2020. Um, um, is this 2020? <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Um, this 2020, um, if you look at it, there's a future that you can foresee for, for sure, which is that pyramid. But I think there's another future, a future that has lots of uncertainty, which uncertainty means you can go to the positive side or, or the negative side. Um, and, and, and this is the unforeseen future. And, and for me, what I'm, I'm hoping on for the new generation, for the Le Lewa period, is and we can kind of go more in a deep dive on this in, in the discussion in the latter half is I think this generation is very, very important. What we call the millennials um, and the, uh, the, the theory of this, uh, the generation Z, I think. Because if you think about it, people in their thirties right now, they're gonna be in their sixties <clears throat> in 2050. People in their twenties are gonna be in their fifties. People in their tens are gonna be forties. So it's obvious that this, this generation are the main actors for the Japan going forward beyond 2020. Um, but there, there's a small population of them. That's the problem. But they're known as the digital native, which means they don't know a world that's not connected. Internet was always connected for them. So if you think about it, you work in Japan, you live in Japan, um, 
But if you think, oh, wow, I'm connected to the world. <clears throat> if that switch comes on, um, what, what kind of uh, world do you see? Actually, this generation are, are, isn't a population minority. If you look at the world, it, it, it's, it's very, very young. <clears throat> and, and most of the young people are in the emerging countries like, like Indonesia, <clears throat> like India, uh, like Africa, <clears throat> very, very young. And so if you think about it, if you look at it just within the border of Japan, um, the, this generation is a minority, but if you look at it globally, <clears throat> They're not the minority, it's the majority. Basically, I mean, they're the new generation, which has the potential to have new successful models for, for, for the new, new era. So in closing, um, my hope, this is my hope, um, is that Japan can create a new uh, success model for the future. Um, in the past, Japan was this, made in Japan, and we were so successful. So successful that we got a lot of bashing, actually. Um, so, so the Showa period uh, success of Made in Japan, we got we got a lot of uh, you know bashing from that. So in the Heiwa period from 1990 forwards, we said, "Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We'll make it in your country, <clears throat> made by Japan." So th this was the model <clears throat> that there was a shift towards this, and there was some certain success, obviously, from that model change as well. But if you think about it, the last 30 years of the Heisei period was a period when, when Japan went from Japan bashing to basically Japan passing. So for the Lewa period, my, my um, hopes <clears throat> is that we can come up with a new, new model for Japan. It's not the made in Japan of the past or made by Japan, but what I'm hoping for is made with Japan, this model. And, and this with is basically saying that the young generation here in Japan, if they can have their switch, turn on their switch, see that they're connected with the world. They see that the world is very young. Most of the young people are in the emerging markets. What are the people in the young people in the emerging markets are looking for? They're looking for a job <clears throat> to pay to, to pay the rent, to pay to pay for their family. And so very, very, you know, there's still a lot of growth left in that kind of environment. But they're the emerging markets. Um, there's lots of social and economic uh, problems, <clears throat> issues. And that's why the SDGs come in. So for that, for that sort of um, angle, for Japan to in embrace the SDGs, it's not just about doing good for the world, which is very important, but I think using the SDGs, a lot of Japanese corporations, not just the large corporations, but, but media, small and medium enterprises, uh, startups, uh, NPO, NGOs, many, many different facets <clears throat> that using the SDGs, we can, Japan can create, co-create prosperity uh, with the new world. And so that, that's, that's my hope. And this is sort of a moonshot, right? It's like, it's just a moonshot. And how do we turn on the switch for the young generation? Um, but we were standing in 2021 looking for the future. What, what, what future do we want to see? The, 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 the foreseen future of this you know, universe pyramid or the unforeseen future with possible opportunities uh, for a new prosperous era of made with Japan. So i um, like to close my remarks, um, but one sort of uh, advertisement. Actually, I started a podcast. <laughs> I turned 60 uh, this month, so I thought I'd try something new. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll do a podcast in English. And, and so I started a, a podcast called Made with Japan. So if you Google madewithjapan.net, one word, made with Japan, then um, the site should come up. But, but the first uh, interview was Takni Nami from Suntry Holdings. So very, very uh, we had a lively, nice conversation. That's already up. And the second is actually, uh, she's an alumni of Columbia, uh, um, Christina Amazon, who is a professor here in Hitotsubashi. And she's also very, very animated. <laughs> um, so we had a nice conversation. So that should be coming up soon. So if you're interested, please uh, check this out. All right, sorry for speaking so fast. I was trying to pack in a lot of things in 30 minutes, but my initial remarks are over. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that was really great. And uh, uh, great to hear that you were, you were uh, talking with uh, Minami-san. Uh, Suntory is actually a sponsor of the center. So uh, that was a little, uh, unpaid advertisement. That, that worked out. That worked out. <laughs> uh, we didn't communicate ahead of time about this. Um, I have lots of questions, but uh -huh. uh, I'm just going to hold off for a moment because I want to give uh, one of our students um, 
uh, a chance to uh, ask a question. Uh, so Yasuhiro Kanemaru is a uh, student here at Columbia Business School, and uh, he's prepared a, a, a few questions. And um, I'm going to let him introduce himself, and uh, you can ask a couple of questions, and then turn it back to me, and um, uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, Yasuhiro. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Great. Yes. All right, so uh, thank you very much, Shibasa-san, for sharing your insight today. Uh, it is very helpful. Uh, again, I am Yasuhiro Kanemaru. I'm a first year MBA student at Columbia Business School. Uh, personally, I'm very you know, interested in recent trend to redefine traditional capitalism. And I'm also interested in the capital for good. So I mean, especially in ESG investing or impact investing. So. Uh, today's presentation was very, very helpful to me. So thank you again uh, for sharing. So uh, my question is actually about, you know, impact investing. So if we apply the concept of uh, Rongo and Soroban to the finance, it would be similar to, you know, the concept of ESG investing or impact investing. But in Japan, a uh, massive amount of capital has been shifted to uh, ESG investment in the past five years. Uh, while a small amount of capital has been allocated to impact investing. And uh, according to GSG, a uh, global steering group for impact investing, uh, only 2% of impact investors are located in East Asia. So my question is, what do you think are the challenges to be tackled to expand impact investing in Japan or uh, East Asia? Okay, thank you very much for a very uh, important question that I think about almost every day, uh, Yasuhiro-san. Um, um, I think the first is there's this mental sort of uh, block when you hear the word impact investing or social or social impact investing. A lot, a lot of people here in Japan thinks that's sort of uh, uh, nonprofit stuff. <clears throat> that you're doing good socially, but that there, there, there's no return. So I think we need to define clearly what impact investing is about. Um, and to me, that's you have to have the intent to have social impact, but at the same time, you have to have uh, economic return um, for it. And so it's not, it's not charity, <clears throat> um, but it's actually an investment with impact. Uh, and the second part uh, the, that I think is sort of blocking uh, lots of the um, the uh, institutional money to come into impact investing here in Japan is the fact that, well, there's two aspects. What, what, one is that in Japan, institutional investors look, look for a track record, senlei, which for a lot of the impact investing, um, especially here in Japan, there's no really track record. And also, if you think about from Japan to the emerging markets that I talked about, Frankly, that's where I think most of the economic returns and impact investing will come from, <clears throat> just because they have they have the potential for growth because of the population, because of the social need, and so because of the economic need. Um, but Japan institutional investors um, has have this um, trauma of investing in emerging markets. Um, I think uh, back in the 80s and 90s, they, they went to Latin America and got burnt um, and went to some other areas, got burnt. Um, you know, and so they have this sort of trauma about emerging markets and you're thinking about impact investing into emerging markets and kind of like, well, maybe we'll study a little bit more. Japanese is very good at studying, so we'll study it a little bit more. Um, Another aspect of impact investing, which I think this is a, it's an issue for all global <clears throat> uh, institutional investors. And this is why I think impact investing has come to a new level uh, last couple of years is, is this, this notion of measurement. So, so what, what's, a, what's a real impact investment? Well, you're actually able to measure the impact, right? Um, and so being able to measure is very, very important for uh, institutional investors because they're fiduciaries. They can't just say, oh, this sounds cool, uh, we'll, we'll invest. They have to explain it to somebody else. And, and economic return is very, very easy to explain in a sense because you can put a number on it. But when you're saying impact, <clears throat> economic impact, social impact, um, it can mean different things to different people. And so, so I think we're in the process right now of trying to come up with a common language for what um, social and what economic impact is about. 
and, and so um, it's a work in progress, basically. But um, I, I'm very, very encouraged that uh, Kanemasan that you you're interested in, in impact investing because I think um, this is this is the one um, I was mentioning earlier that the new generation uh, that creates the new uh, success model for the new era. Um, Impact investing is one way to able to uh, um, show that basically, right? <clears throat> and so, and, and and I've been involved in trying to start up impact investing here in Japan um, for the last three years, and and lots of lots of people in your generation <clears throat> are interested in this era, and and I think it's 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 actually a shame. I think I'll say it because it's in, it's in English. I think it's a shame that the financial institutions here in Japan can't pull the trigger more. And you know, and um, put more resources toward not not just the capital, um, but because but of the young generation that's eager to explore this new uh, frontier, basically in investment, which is a key part, I think, I believe, for the made with Japan model <clears throat> that I'm hoping for in the coming years. Thank you very much, uh, and I thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to ask uh, the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Right. Thank, thank, thanks very much. I, I, I was, um, I was fascinated by your, 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 your talk, uh, Ken, and um, in particular, um, I teach a course here at Columbia on the uh, Japanese economy, mm -hmm. and uh, your, your, your discussion about the cycles made me think of something uh, related to your, to uh, Aichi Shibuzawa, which is, you know, if you'd gone to Japan and if we could all go back to Japan in 1600. Um, we would have found that Japan looked an awful lot like a lot of Europe at that time. But whatever you say about the Tokugawa regime, as far as we know, in terms of it, Japan's development, Japan in 1870 had pretty similar standards of living as Japan in 1600. So in other words, the Japanese growth was incredibly flat over that whole time period, while in the West, you know, you had the Industrial Revolution and, you know, Britain in 1870 looked very, very different than Britain in, in 1600. And then, you know, thanks to people like your father, uh, not father, what am I saying, great, great <laughs> grandfather. Uh, sorry, you're, 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 you're not that old. <laughs> um, uh, think that, you know, um, you know, Japan suddenly changed, right? Uh, there, was, there was, you know, the, the if you've been forecasting, you know, the future based on the past, that would have worked tremendously in Japan up until 1870 or so, and then it stopped working completely after that. And it kind of raises a question. Uh, you know, we've also, as you raised, you know, point that you raised was that Japan has had kind of 30 not so great years, um, and potentially we're at a point of uh, we're, at, we're, at, we're, at, we're at an inflection point. And so I guess one question I wanted to, to, to ask you is, you know, kind of if you could channel your, you know, Eiichi Shibusawa and just kind of think, you know, suppose, you know, he had his ideas and, and were alive today and we're kind of coming out in a world in which, in which we've had this long stagnation, you know, he's, he's dealt with a world of long stagnation and was part of big change. What do you think he would change or would recommend to change? And if that's too hard, what would you recommend to change in Japan? <laughs> that's, that's, um, even yeah. <laughs> how, that's even harder. That's even harder. How do we how do we think about you know this move to the future, right? If if we are going to have that 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 development over the next thirty years. You know, what are the things, you know, what's the equivalent of Daichi Kangyo Ginko or you know, uh, DKB or the, the bank that he founded? Um, yeah. um, you know, what is the, what is the, um, what is it that, that needs to be done? Well, um, <clears throat> it's a lot of, lots, lots of uh, angles I can, I can tackle with that question. It's a very important question. Um, um, I think, I think if you got rid of three phrases here in Japan, three phrases that's used a lot in Japanese organizations, I, I think will solve a lot of the problems that I think you, you mentioned. Um, uh, and w one would be uh, in Japanese, zen ga nai. there's no precedent. <clears throat> if you got rid of that word. Second is, so, so toranai, which means that won't pass through the organization. I think it's a good idea, but it won't go through the organization. 
You can't use that word. And, and the third is, who's going to take the responsibility? Well, it's obviously you and, and your boss and, and the CEO. I mean, who else is going to take the responsibility? You know, so <clears throat> that should be a no-brainer. But I think those three words, actually, I've heard of it countless times in many, many different you know scenarios last 10, 20, 30 years. And if those kind of that kind of words, meaning that kind of thinking, was eradicated from the Japanese organizational mind, so much, so much, moto, so much resources in, in Japanese corporations. If you think about it, the top university graduates in our nation join large corporations. The top, basically, right? Well, you, you, no, nah, well, let me take that back. The real, real, real top, I, I don't think, are joining large corporations as a result because they feel like they're not be they're not be able to um, maximize their, their potential in a large corporation. And so, so it's a, it, should, it should be a wake up call. <clears throat> and, and there is a wake up call for, for a lot of the senior management that maybe they're missing a lot of the young um, talent to come to their large organization, but still the education system and the entry point into large corporations is still pretty much show up period. <clears throat> basically, you know, mass, mass hiring at, at one time, <clears throat> that, that kind of mentality. So, um, so from that aspect, <clears throat> I think we, sh we need to change. <clears throat> and, it, there, um, and I think for, for Shibasa Aichi, if he, you know, when, when he, if he came back now and looked around to what happened to the companies that he, you know, held founded, um, he would be, I think, rather angry <laughs> in a sense that 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 you know uh, basically the angry in a sense that says like yeah i mean you need to be more future looking you know that you need to take more risk <clears throat> and, and you know and, and but uh, because i think if you look and read H. Uh, Sibasa's words. He's known as this, you know, father of Japanese capitalism, ethical capitalism, kind of seems like a nice old man kind of, you know, that kind of image. <clears throat> but if, if you look, actually read his words, there's, it's, it's, it's got a lot of edges. <clears throat> it's got a lot of edges because basically he's unsatisfied with the current state of, of the society. He's unsatisfied with the current state of the management corporates. Um, he's unsatisfied with, with the managers. Basically, because he thinks there's there's a better tomorrow than today, <clears throat> that that kind of future looking uh, uh, aspect to it, and and that kind of message I think is necessary for right now, especially because we're at this very very important uh, time <clears throat> when Japan is trying to shift from the old Japan to the new Japan. I mean, what what, what you say is is very interesting because, you know, he was a person, um, you know, who grew up in probably one of the most conservative societies that ever existed, right? Uh, Tokugawa Japan was all about staying the same over, over centuries, and yet he, he transformed it. And it raises a question, you know, one of the things that's been remarkable is that, you know, they've been, they, they mentioned the, uh, the historical drama that's uh, now on television and people seem to be very drawn to him uh, in, in, in Japan. What do you think it is about him that's causing people to be so, um, you know, what, what about his achievements and his thoughts that are, that are causing this to happen now and not, you know, 30 years ago? Um, I think it, because it, I think this is same for the stakeholder capitalism. <clears throat> Um, we didn't talk about stakeholder capitalism 30 years ago. I mean, you know, people people at the World Economic Forum says that we've been talking about it, but it wasn't getting much attention 30 years ago. And the reason I think is because the back in, let's say, up until, well, for me, a big sort of impact in my in my career and my life was actually 9-11 when I was traveling the United States and I was stuck <clears throat> uh, in Seattle. Well, not supposed to be stuck, but I was I was grounded in Seattle for, for about for the week. I thought, man, it's like, this is, this is really bad. Um, but if you think about it, you know, that image is the Twin Towers coming down. We saw it, you know, constantly. But if you think about it, back in 2001, just 20 years ago, uh, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have Twitter. Um, so that, that kind of images all came from the media press <clears throat> and, and was sort of sent out in a sort of one-way, uh, you know, flow. And, and we're on the receiving end. Now... Every day, every, everybody has a device <laughs> and, and, and they, they can be their own media, right? And so the, the, the flow of information is not one way, but it, it's very, very uh, chaotic. 
But in that chaos, let's say, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a little girl in Sweden, it, it, you know, become, becomes this, you know, heroine for, for, for you know, environmental issues. Um, but if there was no internet, you know, she would probably be still standing in front of her school saying, I'm not going to school, you know, um, mm -hmm. because if no, no press picked it up. And, and the reason why I think corporate managers are saying like, ooh, maybe you need to look at not just the shareholders, but stakeholders is the fact that in the past, let's say a company working at a, your, you know, I'm saying an employee working at your company um, is unsatisfied or maybe some, you know, there's some um, something wrong or what's the right word for in English to say it. So a um, little, you know, some little act, uh, I, I'm, I'm so used to speaking Japanese these days. Like, <laughs> my, my, my doing this got really, really, really bad. Um, anyway, but if there's some issue <clears throat> with the company, um, and if the and if the press picks it up, it becomes a pretty big issue. Um, but if if it doesn't, nobody knows about it. But now anybody can put it up on the social media, right? And if for some reason it just goes viral, then it becomes a very big issue. And so I think the um, corporate managers figured out that well, we just can't be looking at the shareholders, but we need to be looking at our employees, our customers, the society, because because the flow of information is not one way, and anything can come up. And if you think about it, a, a CEO of a corporation, what's on their mind all the time? How do how do you control risk? And so, to me, stakeholder capitalism is, is a way. I think basically saying we need to control this new risk <coughs> of flow of information, which is totally different from 20, 30 years ago. So I want to ask a follow-up question, actually, um, uh, from one of the uh, uh, participants. Um, you may know her, Anna Maria Sasagawa. Um, mm. uh, wrote, 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 she she uh, interviewed me. <laughs> ah, <okay. laughs> um, anyway, um, I'm going to just uh, do, do uh, has a long question. I'm going to do a shorter version of it. Um, the question is, you know, um, Thinking about this Rongo to Soroban or uh, um, Confucius and uh, Abacus, I guess, um, and and the question is is the and versus the or, and um, you know how do you do both? I think would be the would be the short version of her question. You know what would make it possible for um, corporate managers to both you know because corporate managers also worry about takeover bids and things like that. You know. Um, how do you both deliver sufficient returns to shareholders that you don't have uh, someone, you know, uh, come in and try to fire you for not generating enough value and yet also be socially responsible? Aren't those in conflict? How, do, how does one manage that? Well, um, I think one is human beings have this characteristic that's not that it's very unique to us apparently that no other living organism including the higher primates don't, doesn't have the same characteristic we have and, and that characteristic it's actually called imagination and so apparently the other sort of higher primates they're very intelligent but they can't be they're they're at one place at one time <clears throat> apparently but people can be all over the place. We, we can be stuck in our in our in our house during during a crisis like COVID, but in our minds we could be anywhere, right? <clears throat> imagination. And if you think about it, that's probably why imagination is what it's 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 moonshotting, right? And so if you think about it, uh, human beings passed from the you know from the from the primarily primal years basically basically was able to always moonshot, and sometimes we we're able to connect that dot with the present and so um so that so one i think we have to use our imagination and not be not be confined to the current mm -hmm. environment or or situation saying that's impossible the current environment situation might be impossible but if you look at from a different angle use your imagination maybe we'll find a way to merge the two together and the second part of it is the question was how do we do it well yeah that well, well, that's important, but I think the 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 major question is wh why, and this is the word purpose that we've, we've been hearing for the last couple of years, right? Um, wh why do we need why? <laughs> because we need to create a better, sustainable future for our next generation. That's why. And so, unless you have the why question <clears throat> in alignment, um, we can never get to the how. I think, and mm -hmm. and so people are always worried about the how, and it's very important because you need to execute. That's that execution part. 
but I think we always need to have this why why do we need this and, th and that question sometimes is left um, unanswered and we just focus on, on the how so, so actually this leads me to uh, 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 to another question which is uh, also kind of coming uh, from 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 the, from the floor which is um, you know, I thought it was really interesting the way you talked about, um, you know, how you went from made in Japan to made by Japan to now the future being made with Japan. But it strikes me that one of Japan's biggest challenges is um, globalization. And when I mean globalization, I don't mean trade. I mean, kind of integrating, you know, with foreigners, right? Whether, you know, Japan has very small number of immigrants compared to most other 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 developed countries. Um, you know, there's certainly a perception that 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 Japanese corporate culture, you know, with a few exceptions, um, is uh, very notable exceptions. Uh, tends to be fairly closed. That you don't have a lot of foreigners, you know, in on, on in the companies, and you know how how is Japan? You know, when you say made with Japan, you know. And, and I realize I realize this is another how question, but <laughs> um, how do how is Japan going to, you know, become deeply integrated with other countries when their companies, you know, tend to be fairly homogeneous in terms of the personnel that are working there and the language being Japanese, etc. You know, many, many com companies, global companies, have English as a as a corporate language, which enables foreigners to operate fairly easily. You know, if your if your languages are are if your language is Japanese, you're gonna it's gonna be very tough for for large numbers of executives to operate in that environment. So so how how uh, how will Japan turn into a into a country in which made with Japan is the future? Right. I think this this undercurrent of actually, if you think about it, if you look at it in like 30 year time snap, like 30 years ago, 30 years ago, it was unusual to see a non-Japanese native working for a large Japanese corporation. Very, I mean, a couple, very, very rare, right? <clears throat> um, these days, it's not it's not so rare, you know, um, still very small number, number of small, but currently it, it's, it's, it's become not, not, not abnormal <laughs> right mm -hmm. um and, mm -hmm. and and if you looking back 60 years ago my elementary school the public elementary school that i went here in japan it was very very homogeneous <clears throat> when my children went to school, the same school um about 40 years later which is about you know 10 years ago 10 something years ago it was so international i mean there's like lots of lots of different you know um, um people nationalities <clears throat> at a public uh, uh, institute uh, education uh, elementary school and so the the trend is there <clears throat> but the question is how do we get to the next level <clears throat> I think the trend is is not is in the right direction but how do we accelerate it and I think I think this COVID kind of really did it in a sense the reason why I think of that is if before before COVID for a lot of people working for Japanese corporations the the probably probably going to their going to their office that was their job Right, going to the office, you know, going through commuting to their, and you know, that was their job. But with COVID, kind of like, well, gosh, I don't need to go to my office <laughs> to do my job. And so basically, it, it kind of released this thing where like everybody had to come to one place, do their job, and then go home. But now it's like, well, it's kind of the there's a hub, I guess, but but they can be anywhere. And I think this is a very very important uh, sort of uh, mindset that you don't actually have to be inside your company to do the work, you can do it from the outside, which basically means we don't have to actually be working here in Japan, you could be working outside of Japan. So basically, I think in a sense, it sort of uh, destroyed the sort of the sort of the boundaries <clears throat> of what work is about, in a sense. And so, and so that's, I think, how in a sense that because I think in, in a sense, it's so comfortable we're here here in Japan, <laughs> living here in Japan. So so why why do we want to go outside? It's like so it's so comfortable, <laughs> you know. Well, but I, if, you're, if you're forced to go outside, you kind of like well, then you see a new perspective, right? Well, and and, and probably in it, you know if we think back to Eiichi Shibasawa, it was you know uh, Japan tried to be insular, and eventually the world came to Japan. Exactly, and, uh, there exactly. Was no choice. Yeah. Um, I, I have one super quick question because we're very sh we're, we're 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 short on time, um, but um, 
Uh, just as a, as a final final statement, just just thirty seconds. Um, you know, what do you think if if uh, this kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier? If uh, H. Shibusawa could advise you know young students or or you know at uh, Columbia Business School or or you know thinking about careers in in business, what do you think is the most important thing that that he would uh, he would suggest to them about the future? Let's say see the world. See the world. Because okay. H.C. Sibisawa, he saw the world when he was 27 years old, you know, went to the Paris Exposition that really opened up his eyes. And so um, in, in a quick short, I'd say, I'd say, go see the world and make your own decisions based on that observation. That sounds like that sounds like very sound advice. And one, one of the best ways to see the world is come to Columbia Business School. So. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that wasn't planned either, right? <laughs> I'm a professional. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We're, we're, we're out you. of time. Um, and it was a tremendous talk. And um, uh, I think we all uh, learned a lot. And uh, I just want uh, everyone, I know we can't clap, but uh, uh, to, to thank um, our speaker today, Mr. Ken Shibasawa, um, for a really illuminating uh, discussion. And also, I want to thank our uh, corporate and individual sponsors for their support uh, during this uh, these difficult times. Uh, you know, it's not easy to run these programs. Um, and without your help, uh, it wouldn't be possible. Uh, so thank and thank. Lastly, thanks to the the audience um, for joining us and everyone. Uh, stay safe, and um, I look forward to seeing you at the next event.